This is the Gospel of John. I'll be reading you chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Three days later, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When wine was lacking, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Dear woman, what am I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. There were six stone water pots sitting there for the purifying custom of the Jews, holding between twenty and thirty gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of ceremonies had tasted the water that was made into wine, not knowing where it was from, though the servants who drew the water knew, he called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man puts out the good wine first, and when men have drunk plenty, then the cheaper wine, but you held back the good wine until now. This first of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, openly displaying his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So this was the first public miracle that Jesus performed, and it was not before multitudes on the mountaintops or in the crowds on the seashore or before the high and the mighty in Jerusalem. It happened upon the occasion of a simple country wedding in the hills surrounding the Sea of Galilee. It is considered the first of the miraculous signs attesting that Jesus was the Messiah. I don't want to get too far ahead here. We will return to the miracle itself, but I don't want us to miss some of what this scene has to teach us from the Word of God. Jesus was called with his disciples to be guests of honor at this wedding. If you want your marriage to work, you need to start with Jesus at your wedding. Amen? Amen. It would be a good idea to keep them around for the reception, too, if you've seen some of those receptions out there. Um, This was evidently not the wedding of two wealthy families. Somehow they ran out of wine. It was embarrassing. It was mortifying. Nobody wants a catastrophe at a wedding. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, likely, a relative of the bride or the groom, and she was concerned when they ran out of wine, and she had standing to tell the servants what to do around there. I went on Reddit. Who knows what that is? No one knows what Reddit is. Good. Don't go there. Uh, I went on Reddit. It's just an internet forum where they talk about everything. You can learn all kinds of stuff on the internet, and that's one of the places. And they compile stories, personal stories from the lives of people. That's one of the things they do there. And I went on there to look up stories of wedding disasters. And of the many things that happen, a very, very common theme is the catering catastrophe. Um, The whole wedding party is kept standing around hungry and thirsty. The bride is in tears. The groom is ashamed. The in-laws are angry. The couple starts off the marriage with a stained reputation in the community. And the bad memory of what should be a blessed day remains with them for the rest of their lives. I have compared translations and commentaries to uh, write the paraphrase of that expression that I read to you today, in which Jesus answered Mary, his mother, Dear woman, what am I to do with you? That word woman there, rather than mother, was often used as a familiar endearment in ancient Judea. In the younger days of the English language, one might have said milady, but that is a little too formal for our times. And what am I going to do with you? also has a more familiar uh, feeling to it, and it is more in keeping with what was to come. You see, some of the older translations and commentaries were written in the hard old days of a great conflict between Protestants and Catholics, and they took the position that Jesus was rebuking Mary, and 
this was a blowback against those who revered Mary to the point of worship. Now, we Baptists think an awful lot of Mary, uh, but we don't worship her. Still, it wasn't necessary to teach that Jesus was actively rebuking his mother here. I submit that since Jesus immediately turned around and granted her prayer, likely in a way that she could not have imagined, he was not being harsh with his beloved mom. Even so, Jesus wanted Mary, as well as his disciples and relatives, to know that his time had not yet come for the great public miracles of his ministry. When that time was indeed come, it would end with an event that would pierce her very soul with a sword. But what he was about to do on this much happier day would still display his glory over. This miracle was for the sake of his disciples to increase their faith and was done as an act of kindness and mercy and grace and joy. It would show the abundant blessings that God provides. And by such signs, God the Father testified that Jesus was his son. And furthermore, the form of this miracle would also show the divine nature of Jesus who was Emmanuel our Creator and God with us. We look at how it happened. Mary had notified Jesus that the wedding had no wine left. She didn't tell him or ask him to do anything. She just informed him of what was concerning her. But she did bring the matter to his attention, and she knew that whatever he did, it would be wonderful. That was some amazing faith that Mary had. And in a mother's way, she wanted Jesus to do what he could. And of all the things that Jesus did, our only reliable accounts are found in the Gospels, in our Bibles. There are other stories and there are other legends out there. John tells us the world would be filled with books telling the things Jesus did. Perhaps Mary had seen some things in the 30 years that went before that, things that we don't know about. Was there some night in Nazareth when a house full of hungry children surrounded a widowed mother and she wondered how she would feed them. Did an event like that happen? Did her eldest son do as Elijah did to provide enough oil out of a single pot for a widow to keep her two sons out of dead slavery? We don't know. Surely she had come to depend on Jesus who had to step up. He became the carpenter of Nazareth and possibly the head of the house upon the presumed early death of Joseph. We can be sure that Mary had such faith that she merely brought the need of this Mary and couple to the attention of Jesus, knowing that he would know what to do. Isn't that a good way to pray? Just bring it to God and trust that he will know what to do. He answered her in this very familiar and loving way, and then he, she turned to the higher help and told them to do whatever Jesus said. And even if the servants didn't have the faith of Mary, they were obedient. How many miraculous things might we see in the church even today if we would just be obedient, however small our faith? There were six vessels there, carved out of solid stone. These normally held fresh water so that the Jews could all wash their hands and perform uh, other rituals of washing before eating and what have you. This uh, may have been unusual in the Gentile world back in those days. It may be unusual in Auburn, Alabama, but they always washed their hands. You could laugh at They always washed their hands uh, before eating. It was not neglected by the observant Jews, even at a party where a lot of water was needed. These six vessels all together held something like 160 gallons of water when the servants did as Jesus said and filled them all to the brim. Then he commanded that they draw some out and take it to the man in charge. There's a thought out there that this master or ruler or governor of the feast or master of ceremonies, whatever you want to call him, was a local priest who was brought in to bless the wine and the food and the house and, of course, the happy couple. Such a person might also be there to keep things from getting out of hand. After all, the psalmist speaks in Psalm 104, verse 15, of how God created 
wine that maketh glad the heart of man. And we've all heard of the wedding receptions and parties that got completely out of control. He may have presided over many such gatherings and seems to have known good wine from the lesser stuff. The wine that was common in those days was usually very weak compared to the stuff that we have on the shelves today. It was safer to drink than water in those days. It was a way to store and keep the fruit of the vine without it spoiling back in the days before refrigeration and, uh, and uh, dehydration, all kinds of other processes that we have today and all the additives that we put in to keep food from spoiling. Back then you had to have ways to keep food longer and fermentation was one of those. That's where we get pickles from and that would happen with wine, for example. The admonitions in scripture about not being a drunkard don't be drunk with wine, be drunk with the Spirit. There are many admonitions against uh, being a drunk, and you can be sure that Jesus was not providing all this fine wine so that the party could get drunk. He had a different purpose, and more than one. John then describes the scene wherein this master of the feast tastes what was drawn out of the water pots, and this wine was so delicious that he just has to call the embarrassed groom over to express his surprise and his admiration, because right now nobody else knew about it. The poor groom went from zero to hero just that quick. He had run out of the cheap or the mediocre wine, which was all he could afford, and his master of feast probably did not think much of him compared to the other weddings he had presided over. But now he has to exclaim, You saved the best for last! No one does that! People always put out the good stuff first, and then the cheap stuff when everyone has already had plenty to drink and won't know the difference. This wasn't some off-brand sour wine like the pasta that was drunk by the Roman soldiers. This wasn't something that had just been uh, hurried out of a vat, poured off before or after the good stuff was bottled. This was the very best like a fine old vintage that was collected at a premium price and saved for the high feasts of nobility or royalty or the super wealthy. This wasn't box store wine sold in a box. In that day, we're talking about the difference between the cheap wine stored in leather bags, in wine skins, or the fine wine that was stored in pottery and fora. Wine can go for hundreds or even thousands of dollars a bottle. If this was just, let's say, $100 a bottle of wine, Jesus gave that poor couple a commodity worth an awful lot of money. If it was 100 bucks a gallon, that would be $16,000 worth of wine they could have sold on. If we're talking uh, four bottles to a gallon, then you're talking about $64,000 worth of wine. Isn't that something? I mean, even if it wasn't that much, we're still talking thousands and thousands of dollars worth of fine wine that Jesus had just made for this couple here. Wine was a common beverage. It was part of everyday life in those days. Jesus used the parable of new wine and new wine skins and uh, how you couldn't fill up an old wine skin that had already been stretched out with new wine because it's going to ferment and uh, there'll be gas and it will expand and it will just blow that old wine skin out. You have to put it new wine and a new wine skin so that it will all grow together. They were familiar with wine and its quantity and qualities. A fine wine takes time. There's a process involved. You can't skip steps. A vineyard has to be dug out and it has to be planted. Um, the grape vines have to be found, perhaps chosen over generations from the best seedlings of the best grapes to make the best wines. The ground has to be cultivated and fertilized and irrigated. The plants have to be trained to the trellises. The vines have to be pruned. Jesus talked about that. If they're unfruitful, those vines had to go. Jesus seems to have known a lot about it. The Son of God was a keen observer of the world around him and used these images often in his sermons and parables. Once the fruitful vines have been harvested, then the grapes have to be pressed to release the new wine. That liquid then has to be processed so that it safely begins fermenting. It doesn't spoil, it doesn't go sour. And then for the finest wines, it has to be carefully aged or even blended. A vintage wine doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen by accident. And as with all things that are of God, this wine created by Jesus was the best. It was the most unobtainable, the most perfect, the most pure. God often 
saves the best for last. And there's a whole sermon in that. That's where that phrase came from, saving the best for last. It came from this lesson right here. There's another profound thing here that struck me some years ago when I was earnestly studying these scriptures. God revealed himself in Jesus when these miracles happened. All of those miracles were, that was God witnessing and testifying to the world that this was his son. And this first miracle of the Son of God compares very closely with the first miracles of God the Father. Six pots were the vessels that held the water that Jesus made into wine. Six days were the vessels that held the chaos that God made into the world. Jesus spoke the wine into being. God spoke the world into being. The wine was as a fine vintage wine, the result of intelligent planning and careful labor. The world was as an incredible ancient cosmos, the result of intelligent design and subtle workings. I've never had a problem with being a man of faith and also being a rational man, hopefully. You can ask my wife about that, whether I'm really rational or not. But we can understand the scientific method and the empiricism that demands quantifiable and verifiable hypothesizing as well as logical and rational theorizing. In English, that means we know science works. That's why we have all of this stuff around us, because it works. I have a problem with the so-called man of faith who cannot admit that there are things he does not understand about how the world might be made. And I also have a problem with the so-called man of science who can't admit that there are things in the world he doesn't understand, and that there are things that he doesn't understand about the one who made the world. I try not to get into contentious arguments with either one of them. I know that a fine vintage wine cannot be drawn out of six pots of water. But it was. I know that a fine vintage universe can't just happen in six days of time. But it did. If Jesus wanted to give a gift to a struggling young man and wife of scores of gallons of precious wine, providing them with a commodity to sell for a good start in their life together, then he could do it with mere words in six pots of water. If God wanted to give a gift to the first man and wife of a spacious and beautiful world, providing them with a garden to tend for the good of humanity, then he could do it with mere words in six days of time. This selection ended with the verse 11. This first of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, openly displaying his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Jesus does not rebuke us when we ask for something for the sake of those who need it. God is not worse than an evil man who will nevertheless feed and care for his own children. Jesus cared about this young couple as surely as God cared about Adam and Eve and as surely as God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost care about each and every single one of us. But let's remember when we ask for something, even for what seems like a good thing for the sake of others, we're not asking for God to change his will, but for his perfect will to be done. When we pray to God for something in the name of Jesus, let us also do it with the understanding that it is the will of God that anything he does for us will be something that openly displays the glory of Jesus. It will be something that will increase our faith in the Son of God. So let us never fear to ask, but let us also ask rightly so that we will see Jesus glorified and then we should expect the unexpected and look forward to being amazed at what the Son of God